give you are here. Um, but the reason that that reason is here in many respects is because of our 50th anniversary. And I just want to say a few words about this because um, I don't know if you know about the history of the Society and uh, there's an, uh, information within the catalogue um, that tells you a little of our background. But it was set up 50 years ago um, with the insight of a very special person who's still an extraordinarily active member, a key member of the Society 50 years on, and that's Robert Gilmore. And I think everyone in this room would uh, like to take a moment to thank him because without his energy, his insight and his enthusiasm, I don't think that the SWLA would be here 50 years down the line. So we can all take a moment. before we introduce Sir David. But um, I'm sure that, that you've realised or you've noticed that we've um, produced a book this year. Um, it's called The Natural Eye and it's um, uh, optimistically called Art Book One uh, because we hope to do subsequent ones on a, a biennial basis. Now, a lot of the press releases went out biannual. Well, I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown if I have to do it twice a year. But anyway, the, the book, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a background about the book and, and also urge you to perhaps think about buying a copy because you will be helping our bursary scheme and allowing us to set up potentially um, much, more, uh, much bigger projects that will involve artists from all different uh, backgrounds and actually help with conservation possibly. But it's one of those things that when you're very close to something like that, you know, having worked so closely, and I would love to thank, I can't see her, but Sarah Whitley of Red Hair Publishing, we must thank her, where she is over there, because without her energy and enthusiasm, to use the same phrase, that book would not have existed. And I would also like to thank uh, Mike Dawson from Swallowtail Print, um, because he's been extraordinarily kind and helpful and gone beyond the call of duty, but I would say that Sarah's gone beyond the call of duty as well. But anyway, this book, um, which is available from the front desk, please, um, is a, a, a sort of tribute to our artists and the talent of our artists. We could have produced a book that had um, sort of showcase pieces, sort of cherry-picked by the artists themselves. But what it is, in fact, is a book that in, incorporates donated pieces. So the artists gave us A5 pieces that were donated, which we then raised more funds with. And I think it's an extraordinary snapshot into the way that the artists work. And often there's a, there's a lightness of touch with the pieces. And you have 55 different artists represented in that book. Um, and uh, I, I urge you to take a look and, and think about it as a wonderful Christmas present for anyone who's interested in, in art and wildlife. It's a, it's a perfect thing. Um, I would also, uh, no, let me think what else I was going to say. Uh, but you see, I, I'm very, I'm not very prepared, that's the trouble with me. Um, so, anyway, you're not here to um, listen to me burbling on. Um, you're here to hear something from the person that probably cringes as well as you described as a national treasure. But what, what I think is so amazing about Sir David is the fact that he communicates across um, to people from all backgrounds. Um, and it isn't just people who are interested in the natural world and, and wildlife. And uh, for me, that is such a powerful, powerful tool for conservation. That communication that, that has happened in all the years that he's been involved with broadcasting and the enthusiasm that still burns so brightly. So I'd just like to hand you over to David. And thank you very much for coming. We're all thrilled. And uh, if you'd like to say a few words, please. Um, make your appreciation. It's a proud moment, this, you know. 50 years uh, of the Society. 50 years in which these exhibitions have brought the cream of wildlife art to an audience, a very big audience, many of whom perhaps have not thought of the conjunction between wildlife and art. One of the commonest questions which I'm asked by journalists and so on is, I can't help feeling it's a, a falsely naive question, but they say, and tell me, uh, David, uh, how did you first become interested in the wild world, in animals? And I confess, I think it's a false question, because 
as I say in reply always, I am sure that you, when you were a child, were interested in it. Oh yes, I was. Yes. There is no child, in my view, who is not interested in the wildlife. A four-year-old turning over a stone, looking at a slug, and seeing the tentacles and touching them or putting a hand in front of them and seeing that those tentacles are actually sense organs. And how does it move and what does it eat? That curiosity in the natural world and life with which we share the world is right within the heart of all of us. Now it's true that as we get older, there are more and more temptations to take our minds away from the natural world. This age today, more than ever, all these wonderful electronic gadgets. But all I can say is that if you, there's room for these electronic gadgets, but if you actually lose that touch, that curiosity, that delight in the natural world, you have lost one of the most precious of all humanity's possessions. Now, the United Nations tell us that over 50% of the population of this world is now urbanized. That means over half the people living in the world today see less of the wild world than they did, than their ancestors did 100 years ago. And some are totally cut off from the natural world. They don't see a wild thing from morning till night unless it's a pigeon or a rat. <laughs> what a loss. <coughs> but with that loss, with that threat of that loss, becomes increasing awareness of the preciousness of the natural world. And we all know that the natural world is now in greater danger than it has ever been, certainly since the time of the dinosaurs. So the contact we have, the vision, the insight with the natural world is as precious to us now as urban human beings, more precious than it's ever been. How is that communication, that communion, with that natural world maintained by talented people, by artists, by filmmakers certainly, but artists, writers, and above all, graphic artists, sculptors, painters, watercolorists. They convey not just the appearance of the natural world, they, in some magical way, which people write about for hundreds of words and thousands of words, but still can't quite identify, they actually convey, with their, if they're great artists, as many of these people are, they convey something special. Not just the appearance, something special about life. Life, which we have, and which their subjects have. And the results are all around this world. Objects of most beautiful objects. Paintings of beautiful objects. Paintings of objects which may not have struck you initially as beautiful. But paintings of objects which have a life. That's what makes these remarkable pictures the reaction of the painter and the sculptor to his subject, the cherishing of the life which they share with their subject and which enables us to share with them. So we are very fortunate that there are so many talented people producing such lovely things. And all I can say is congratulations and thanks to all those who produce these things, and I won't stand between you, between you and them, any longer. <laughs>